one. <laughs> Allô tout le monde derrière vos écrans. Welcome to our final Volume Montreal event on this fourth and final day. Uh, bienvenue à la, le dernier événement de la foire, de cette troisième édition de la foire Volume. Um, Aujourd'hui, on a Jim Holio qui nous présente ses livres d'artistes ses cahiers de dessin en relation avec la pratique de randonnée, ce qui lui permet de dessiner sur place puis de sourcer des histoires puis des images directement du paysage. Il va aussi nous présenter son livre « Le Book of 19 Nocturnes », qui est un travail en 19 volumes entièrement dessiné, assemblé à la main, en livre accordéon, qui regroupe des dessins au graphite, à l'aquarelle, à la peinture, à l'encre, puis des textes en collage. Today, what's happening is that Jim Holyoke will present his handmade artist books and sketchbooks in relation to hiking, which allows him to draw in situ and source images and stories from within the landscapes. He's going to present the book of 19 Nocturnes, which is a 19-volume, fully hand-drawn and handmade collection of accordion books that have graphite, dra and graphite drawings, watercolors, ink paintings, collage text, and it's all around a wonderful book. <laughs> um, before we start, there's just a few housekeeping things to go over. Um, my name is Maya. I'm the programming coordinator. Uh, I use she, her pronouns if ever you need them. Um, this meeting will be recorded. We'll add subtitles to them and it'll all be posted back up on um, the volume YouTube page uh, for perpetuity afterwards. Um, probably sometime next week by the time we get around to uploading and translating and all that. Um, you can ask questions, um, type written questions whenever as you'd like, and we'll uh, tally them and answer at the end. Uh, vous pouvez poser des questions en français aussi, uh, puis je vais pouvoir faire la traduction pour... Uh, ouais, je vais pouvoir faire la traduction. Vous pouvez les écrire n'importe quand, ou bien à la fin, um, vous pouvez utiliser la fonction de lever la main, puis uh, comme ça, je peux activer votre micro pour poser la question um, de vive voix. Um, if you'd prefer, also at the end, you can use the raise hand function and then we can unmute your microphone to ask the question in person if you prefer that. Voilà pour ça. Um, I have a small intro for Jim. Uh, Jim is a drawer and writer based in BC, Canada. His discipline is comprised of book arts, ink painting, room size drawing installations. In parallel to his solo practice, Holyoke has orchestrated numerous collaborative drawing projects, often with fellow artist Matt Shane, and sometimes involving hundreds of people drawing together. Holyoke received a BFA from the University of Victoria, an MFA from Concordia University, and studies as an apprentice to master ink painter Xing Ying Xiang in Yang, uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce this province. Can you help me? Yang Suo. Yang town. Suo. Perfect. Thanks so much. <laughs> Um, he has attended artist residencies in New York, LA, Mumbai, Banff, the Netherlands, Finland, Sweden, Iceland, and throughout Norway. His work has circulated widely in Europe and North America, including the Musée d'Art Contemporain de Montréal, the GM Museum of Contemporary Art in The Hague, the Drawing Association in Oslo, the Latvian Center for Contemporary Art in Riga, and the Carnegie Mellon International Drawing Symposium in Pittsburgh. I'm happy to call you my friend, and um, thanks for being here today. All right. Um, bonjour tout le monde. Hello, everybody. Um, thanks for attending this webinar, webinar and uh, a big thanks to my friend Maya and to Volume Montreal for inviting me to be a participant. Um, this is my first Zoom presentation, so I'm uh, excited and a little nervous to see how this works out. Um, I've brought here a postcard that I picked up yesterday on the drive. I am in Sinaiq's territory in the West Kootenai region of Eastern British Columbia, but have been based here on Salt Spring Island for the last five months. Yeah, um, so I'm gonna see if I can get my uh, PowerPoint going here, just a second. Okay, all right, how's that? All right, okay, so um, as Maya said, my practice is based between large-scale drawing installations, ink paintings, and creative writing, which extends into bookworks and zines. There's an immersive quality in common with both the drawing installations and a psychologically immersive quality in storytelling. But today it's going to be my bookworks and stories that I'll be particularly focusing on, especially as it relates to walking and hiking as a way of gathering ideas and making drawings outside. 
Um, the first time I remember walking in relation to a creative process was when I was a, uh, a young teenager and I used to play Dungeons, Dungeons and Dragons almost every evening after school at my friend Mikey Valmerbita's house. Uh, to get there, I'd walk to the end of my dead end street and out into a field of tall grass that would eventually lead to Mikey's backyard. And for those of you who don't know D&D, &D, it's a spoken word collaborative role playing game in which you can be any kind of being that you want and explore imaginary worlds with your friends. I was usually a chaotic good priestess who could transform into a polar bear when enraged. Uh, Mikey was a lawful evil necromancer who lived in a graveyard. Um, these D&D &D sessions with Mikey were events of elaborate collaborative storytelling and world building. Um, and we would invent these stories aloud. Uh, here's an Alvin Schwartz drawing of a girl raised by wolves in uh, a book called Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark. Um, this is important in a sense because it scarred my soul as a young, young kid. And uh, I, I never brought a flashlight when walking to Mikey Valmerbita's house. So every night I'd walk home alone in this field where it was often too dark to tell the sky from the ground. So I learned how to navigate by touch, walking with my hands wide open and feeling for the edges of the path with my feet. Um, and I kind of got over fear of the dark. Um, all my life I've been fascinated by animals and the thought experiment of what it would be like to transform into a different kind of creature than I am. Um, I think that looking into the eyes of a salamander is a challenge to our abilities to fathom otherness and to empathize with creatures that are really different than we are. Um, this is a picture of my stepdad, Bruce, holding a Northwestern brown salamander that he uh, saved from some equipment at work. I named her Sweeper after the road cleaning machinery that she was found in. The animals I've been interested in have always included those that don't exist anymore, like dinosaurs, and those animals that never existed at all, which are often called monsters. So here's a couple examples of bestiaries. Uh, this one written by Oberon Zell Ravenheart is one of my favorite. And here they all are collected at present. Um, these books are often inspiration, endless inspiration and source material for my own drawings, of which here's a, a couple of my own pictures of a, of a bat and a, and a beholder. Um, <clears throat> Part of the important, important backstory to my artwork is all the writing and drawing that I do that is never seen. For instance, these are over 20 years worth of diaries that I've been writing in almost every day. Uh, many of them are dream diaries, which I write in many mornings. And some of it I hardly look at ever again, and some of it I do return to as material for, for book works. Uh, these are my sketchbooks collected up. Uh, that I usually have in my backpack. And I always have a notebook in my pocket. I even bring it to the swimming pool with me and leave one of the notebooks at the head of the pool in case I get an idea while I'm swimming. It's partly because my memory is so poor, but it helps me organize my ideas and to um, find ideas spontaneously as I travel in the world. And I thought I might also mention um, this collection of postcards that I've been building and growing as I travel around uh, and also as correspondence with friends and family. I'm always mailing people uh, snail mail postcards still from the places I go. I never really got over that. Um, and these postcards are, you know, they're a deck of cards. So you can shuffle them and reorganize them in new ways. And I'm always kind of sifting through them for uh, images and ideas that might work into my drawings. I wanted to show this picture of my, my bedroom laboratory studio from circa 2002 in Victoria, where I did my undergrad. Uh, as you can see, I cover my walls with drawings, photocopies, and found material that I then collage into book works, uh, such as a series of zines called Monsters for Real that I created in my 20s. Um, they're about, uh, they're 11 zines, again, a volume. They're, uh, turned into a full uh, novel um, detailing the most embarrassing uh, memories that I have from my adolescence. Uh, this page is about being pinched, to, uh, a girl who used to pinch my bum at ele in elementary school. Um, 
this kind of refers back to the 90s DIY culture. The zines were introduced to me by the punk rock scene back then. When the, the internet was at its dawn, people weren't making blogs so much. So I would be manually snipping apart and gluing back together these, these books. Here are some um, collaged ma magazine snippets, plus a, a pros and cons list that I wrote when I was 14 about whether or not I should go out with my first girlfriend in grade eight. Um, a couple weeks afterwards, uh, she dumped me and I checkmarked all the pros and cons that had come true, uh, much of which is pretty humiliating. Um, so moving along, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, particular travels that have been really important to me uh, as an artist. Um, starting with Yangsuo, China, um, and here is Sunling Xiang, my teacher. Um, in 2007, I received a grant from the Contemporary Art Gallery of Vancouver, in Vancouver, to spend two months studying in the town of Yangsuo in southern China, Guangxi province, with a master ink painter named Sunling Xiang, whose specialty is nightscape painting. Here he is looking out over the Lijiang River um, with a forest of giant bamboo growing along the horizon. And in the distance, you see karst mountains, uh, which often seem to float um, in the fog. And it really looks just like a Chinese ink painting. Uh, here are a couple of Sun Ling Xiang's paintings. Um, meeting him was a dream come true for me because of our shared interest of night, in nighttime as a setting. And because I have, had already loved drawing with Chinese ink and brushes, but was self-taught until that time. So in China, I spent two months studying nine hours a day, seven days a week with Sunling Xiang in his studio. Uh, and my ink painting skills got way better. Uh, here's a copy I made of one of Sunling Xiang's works. And I really wish I still had a photo of his original painting because you could see how much better his is than mine. Um, when I got back home, I was trying to figure out what lineage of Chinese ink painting I had been learning because it's a 3000 year old tradition and it varies a lot from region to region. And I learned that Sun Ling's teacher, Sun Ling Xiang's teacher's teacher was a man named Li Karan, who's also made an incredibly beautiful nocturne paintings and for a little while studied in Europe and had brought back the uh, technique of chiaroscuro or using light and darkness to create depth. Uh, and this is an example of one of Li Karan's paintings. So <clears throat> this is a painting I made in Yangsuo, uh, something Xiang thought it was very funny, uh, of this mother dinosaur searching for her baby by that cave. Um, and speaking of caves, I hope you can see right here is a cave in the mountain. This place is called Sin Pin, which is on the back of the 20 yuan bill, last I checked. Uh, and something Xiang and I would spend one day a week going out into the um, countryside and would hang out drawing. Um, so I made copies of his paintings and I worked from photos, I worked from imagination, from memories. And uh, here's an, about eight hours later, the completed ink painting that I made in this dried up riverbed, having been quite sunburned. Here's something Xiang up on the rooftop, uh, about to start a painting, where we would paint until it was too dark to see and then go home on his motorbike. Uh, this is his painting of a bridge with some little little boys hanging out up on top. And this is my painting of the same bridge, uh, having added the turtles later. What you don't see is that I was actually having trouble seeing the bridge because the little boys had surrounded me while I was making this, this painting. Um, after I was uh, wrapping up grad school at Concordia in Montreal, I applied to every artist residency in Norway that didn't charge me to go to it. I knew that I really wanted to go to Norway, and it has turned out to be one of my favorite places in the world. Um, I managed to get into four artist residencies in, the, in a row and have gone back a couple times. Uh, this is a, a photo from Lufuten, which is a mountainous archipelago on, in the Arctic uh, coastline of, of Norway. This photo, in fact, was taken at about midnight, uh, midsummer, and you can see the ink painting I'm working on there is now complete. Um, and this becomes a page for my book, which I'll talk about soon, uh, as does this image here. And these here. The mountain on the left, I thought looked kind of like a Count Dracula mountain, as if it has a cloak of stone wrapping around itself, while the mountain on the right looked more like a rhinoceros or something. 
you can see I'm using rocks to hold down the page so it doesn't flutter away in the wind. That was actually drawn in the yard, the parking lot of a, a whaling museum that's a very pro whaling museum. Um, here later on is my ink painting integrated into my book. Uh, so I, I tend to draw a lot while if, you know, I'm riding on a bus or a train or a plane, um, a subway. Uh, I, I, I like to draw while I'm in motion. I often find that I am able to think of new ideas more spontaneously if I'm in, in motion. So here I am on a boat at the very edge of the Lufthansa archipelago. And this drawing is uh, just outside the Nordic Artist Center Dala on the west coast of Norway. This is Mount Blea, which I looked at every day and watched it change through the seasons. And these two eyes would kind of form as the snow melted. So it was almost like watching the mountain open its eyes and close its eyes as the seasons changed. In Norway, in Scandinavia, there's a, a longstanding myth that the mountains are either giants or the fossilized remains of giants and trolls um, or our um, evidence or traces of the activities of these giant beings battling with gods. And I really like this idea of the landscape being personified in a way, um, even if the, you know, a mountain doesn't literally have eyes. In a way, it really is like a body with us little creatures climbing around on it, much like our bodies are habitats for smaller animals. So here's a couple of more drawings I've made following this idea of metamorphosizing into a landscape and a couple ink paintings I made in Norway. Uh, this drawing was made actually in an area called Jontenheimen, which is also known as the home of giants. Uh, there's a page from my book in process. There I was trekking with my friend Urian Os, who is a uh, notorious artist from the Oslo area, who's a really weird guy. He's the strangest animal that I encountered in the, in the wilderness of Norway, for sure. Um, a lot of times these hikes happen either before or after other projects, exhibitions and residencies. Um, here is a photo of a little hut outside a studio at the Nordic Artist Center Dala, where I shared a studio with Matt Shane, working on a pair of drawings called The Who's Haunts that depicted both the interior and exterior spaces of houses. So that you, kind of like a doll's house, you can see inside and outside at once. And if you step up, step back, it's a, a house, but if you get, come up closer, you'll see that the houses are covered in smaller houses. And all along the floors are little herds of rhinoceroses running around and other little hidden beings and secrets inside of them. Here it is re-exhibited at the Midlands Art Center in Birmingham. It was also in the last Manif uh, the Manif Neuf in Quebec City. Uh, so coming up close, here's a, a Nisa or a little gnome peeking out from a, a, a hole in the ground. These little creatures, you can see the pencil for reference. The one on the left is actually based on a photo of my sister and the one on the right of my brother, uh, my brother Ben, who will come back. Um, I wanted to talk a little for a moment about the difference, uh, differences between drawing in a basement from a photograph on Google Images versus drawing outside in a place you have to walk for many days in order to arrive. Um, there's some special challenges to drawing outside, like being hunted by clouds of mosquitoes. It's really hard to concentrate when there's ticks climbing on your legs. Um, although I like Hiking in the rain and in the snow, it's super hard to draw under those conditions. And uh, this is a, sorry for the graphic image, this is the back of my heel after an old pair of boots drilled a hole into my foot. Um, yes, so many different animals keep me company while I'm out there, uh, from yaks and mules to uh, owls and ptarmigans, hummingbirds. Um, you get fresh air, it's very quiet, no internal combustion engines most of the time. Uh, kind of different than taking a photo, you have to look at a thing for a long time. And after a while, I find that I start to not just be looking at the landscape or at a, a, a feature of the land like a mountain, but I feel like something in between us dissolves and I'm really there with it. And that can give me a, a sense of euphoria um, and I think that just takes time. And during that time, often the world kind of 
slowly changes around me. I end up noticing the movement of clouds, sometimes drawing the clouds as much as the mountains. And also the light can change a lot. But yeah, your paper can blow away, the rain can destroy the, your ink marks. Um, I've been terribly sunburned a lot of times and have donated blood to many small animals. Uh, so I uh, would like to talk about a little bit about the West Coast Trail on Vancouver Island, which is usually about a seven day long trek um, in the rainforest. I've, I've done this now three times. Uh, here's what the trail often looks like. So you, there's no way to stay clean while you're doing this. Uh, the last time I hiked the trail was with my friend Matt Shane. Um, gathering notes and drawings for a project at Open Space Artist Run Center in Victoria. So uh, here's a photo Matt took of me drawing on a log in a stream. And here's one of the drawings I made, sketches I made out there of some mossy stumps that I thought looked kind of like a trollish warthog. So whenever I go out into the forest, I, what I'm worried about is a cougar jumping out of a tree on me or being chased by a bear. Uh, but that's never happened. Um, the animals you're far more likely to encounter or guaranteed to encounter are banana slugs, which are the second biggest slug in the world. Um, the first time I hiked the West Coast Trail, I drew or photographed every slug I encountered and came up with over 70 drawings. Uh, here's a couple of my banana slugs. <laughs> um, and here's one of them uh, as integrated as a giant slug within a drawing installation in open space. So Matt and I spent about two months drawing by night, creating a 90-foot surround panoramic installation at open space. And it's based on our, um, both our experiences as we observe them and also mixing in a lot of imaginary qualities. Uh, here it is uh, also installed at the uh, Midlands Arts Center in Birmingham. Uh, we don't have time to look at it, but Matt and I um, created a, a an online catalog for our project called Forestrial Brain, which we're quite proud of. And it's full of videos and um, has some really great essays. Uh, and it, you can find it at forestrialbrain.ca if you have time and want to. Another important place for me here in BC is the Kootenays region where I am now. Uh, here I am drawing last summer at Jumbo Pass where you can look around in four directions and see four large glaciers hugged between the mountains. Uh, here is Mount Gimli, which is an incredibly steep cliff mountain, uh, where I was approached by a family of goats who were hoping to eat my, my snacks. But they were very funny company to have around. And in the eastern Kootenays um, is the Burgess Shale, which has some of the oldest fossils in the world. Here I am making a, a graphite rubbing from a trilobite the animals there are, the fossils are 408 million years old, excuse me, from the Cambrian explosion. So while we're looking at these little drawings, if you look up, there's these humongous mountains. So there's this feeling of like looking up closer and the mountains almost have drawings on themselves as if they've been tattooed with these creatures from other times. Uh, here's a sketch I made of um, the mandible of a creature called Anomalocaris. So at first, scientists believed that this fossil was the creature itself, but it turns out it's just this kind of trunk-like mandible protuberance off this creature that has no living relatives. It was the biggest predator of its time, about a meter long. And uh, <clears throat> finally, for this traveling section, I'd like to talk about the Himalayas, where I've traveled pretty broadly over the, you know, I, the first time I went there, I was 22 years old. And the last time I was about 41. No, uh, yeah, I was 41 years old. Um, I've traveled in the far west uh, of India in the Ladakh, Ladakh region, uh, in uh, the Tibetan uh, area around Mount Everest, um, in the Manaslu and Annapurna regions. And most recently, I was evacuated from uh, Annapurna after a 27 day hike, I came down and realized that COVID had happened and we were uh, evacuated and repatriated to Canada. That's another story, I'm not gonna go there right now. Instead, I'm gonna talk about this trip from 2016 after a residency in Mumbai, when my brother and I went to Sikkim in the far northeast of India, um, above Darjeeling. Here I am drawing at about 4,200 meters 
at the foot of Kanchenjunga, which is the third tallest mountain in the world. My drawing there is an accordion book, which um, unfolded makes a 180 view of the skyline there. If I'd taken a look the other way, it would be a sea of clouds far below me floating over the, um, uh, the lowlands of Bengal. So here in, in Sikkim, I am uh, drawing with some horses who are really great uh, uh, models. And uh, at, in the evenings, after it got too dark to see, I'd have drawing parties with, here's my brother Ben and a little boy who is the son of the yak handler. They're both really good at drawing yetis. <laughs> uh, here I am drawing a, a mountain range. And my brother asked me to make him a big drawing of the mountains with a pack of wolves running through the snow. So I did this for him. I made a, a five by four foot drawing of the same mountain range, but I added eyes to them. And uh, now he's got this drawing hanging on his living room wall. Uh, here I am making an ink painting of the trees up there, which I later inverted and turned into a blizzard for my book of 19 nocturnes, which is what I have to speak about finally in this presentation. So book of 19 nocturnes took me over 17 years to write and draw. It's 19 volumes of books totaling about 500 pages. And a lot of it was created while traveling um, with notebooks in my pockets and stacks of paper in my backpack. This was the most difficult art project of my life to complete. I heard that if we regenerate all the cells in our bodies every seven years, um, if that's the case, then this book, book wasn't written just by me, but in collaboration with two and a half different versions of myself. Uh, it was originally exhibited at the Optica Artist Run Center in Montreal, and later in Riga for the Survival Kit 9 Festival in Latvia, and most recently at the Alternator Artist Run Center in Kelowna, BC. So now I'll show you a few images of the books as an installation, uh, giving you a sense of the scale. Um, I would leave these white gloves for people to wear, mostly just to remind them that uh, they should be careful. It is fragile and it does fall apart. Um, but uh, yeah, so don't look at these with peanut butter on your fingers. But otherwise, I wanted to encourage people to feel comfortable self-navigating through these books, touching the pages, and coming in and out of the book wherever they feel comfortable. So here's a page of, of newts uh, floating around. <clears throat> and then I'll start telling you a little bit about the story itself, which is about a woman made of wood whose name is Book, who awakens in a forest where the sun never rises and is trying to make sense out of the world, out of her own body, where, where she, she grows um, antler-like branches out of her head whenever she's thinking, like thoughts coming out of her, her, her skull. And the things that she touches can transform into other things. And she, it's, it's a story about wandering around. The plot line is, is very loose. It's more like a series of encounters than a traditional story arc. But she um, encounters different creatures with whom she has conversations and then they leave or she leaves. So it's a lot about loneliness and separation and trying to figure out where in the world she belongs and who are her people. So here she are, is talking with a gargoyle um, or a griffin-like panther in a tree who is actually inspired by my, my thought of cougars. Uh, and here speaking with an owl who tends to just watch things and then float away. This creature is called the Nowhere Wolf, who is the shadow of a wolf who's lost his body. Um, at the end of every chapter or nocturne, Book falls asleep and has a dream. Uh, this is an image from a, a, a dream she has of rowing a boat in a harbor while being followed by a strange creature in the phosphorescent water. She can't see it well, but she can hear the creature smelling her. Uh, I wrote this while rowing in a, a rowboat uh, uh, off on the west coast of Canada um, while being followed by a harbor seal. Um, often the landscape and the atmospheres in the, the story are buzzing with life as if the uh, creatures are, are part of the land or the air themselves. 
That includes the creatures that swim and fly or basically all flying. There's a point in the story where Book has an opportunity to make herself at home and to stay in this house on a little island in the river. Um, but kind of in kin with the Lady of Shalott from Alfred Lord Tennyson's poem, she decides to leave, uh, and that is, in a way, her curse. But when she leaves the island, the whole thing lifts up and tips back into the river like a sandcastle and disappears. And from then on, Book has to wander alone without any place to call home in particular. She wanders in the direction of the mountains into the forests, and I find that when I'm walking around uh, in a wandering sense, and I, and I don't have a destination necessarily in mind, I'm just kind of going, I, I tend to notice things differently. I often slow down and, and notice small things around and think about the, of new ideas. So, I mean, th this drawing I actually made in Quebec uh, in the autumn, um, thinking about how the forests are so dramatic there at that time. But this drawing I made in Norway of a, a woodland troll stomping through the forest with a bag of leaves singing Ugg Fi Huff, which is a trollish, trollish language. I think about trolls as they always, they always have too much of something or not enough, or their body parts are either too big or too small. So if you look closely at this guy, you can see that he has five eyes, an enormous nose, uh, super hairy armpits, and really small balls. Uh, so that's my version of a woodland troll. This is from a dream that Book has, and she awakens in the forest uh, holding an empty nest, uh, and she goes searching around for her friend Mole Sloth, who is part sloth and part mole, uh, part star-nosed mole. So for a little while, they're traveling companions. Book uh, has Mole Sloth dangling from her arm as they hike up into the mountains. Uh, there she finds a cocoon as it hatches and a moth flies out. And then Mole Sloth uh, puts her tentacle into the cocoon and then becomes enwrapped in a giant cocoon made of sticks and branches and grows and grows until she er erupts from the branches as a giant megatherium or a giant ground sloth. And then she runs away chasing after the butterfly, I'm sorry, the moth with book in pursuit until they arrive at a field of charred branches and Molt Sloth runs off into the distance, leaving Book alone. Another uh, character who is recurrent in the story is Bronto Donkey, whose origin is when Book falls down on the ground having tripped over a root. And when she stands back up, her chest is attached to the earth by a long thread of roots, which she pulls out and they grow into a little Diplodocus dinosaur who she pats on the head and he grows little ears. She releases him into the forest where he wanders off, leaving a trail of daisies. And later on, she re-encounters him and uh, grabs him by his nostrils and pulls his nose into a trunk. He whispers into her ear and off they go walking together for a little while uh, until they come to a river at which point Bronto Donkey wanders in and disappears and is gone for a few chapters. He comes back later when Book is drifting in the ocean and finds a ball of drift nets with one living thing in it who happens to be Bronto Donkey. She um, bites the net to free him and then climbs on his back to swim to the shore together. Uh, and there they travel for a little while longer and she pats him on the back and he grows these little useless wings that are too small to actually lift him. And eventually he goes back to the ocean and swims away, leaving her alone. So here you can see some of the fossils uh, that she finds along the shore. Um, emphasizing the plot is, is a probably not the right way to approach this book because it's almost like uh, hallucinations that blur from one dream into another. But along the way, Book has this kind of relationship to the landscape where she's perceiving it as a body and feeling through the ground to a stream under, a, under the snow. She watches a snowflake drift into a hole in her own chest. And she realizes in a way that her own body is the closest thing she has to a home. Uh, 
this book took so much so long because the longer it took to finish the big, bigger it became and the bigger it got the longer it took and so after 17 years i made this monstrous thing which has made for a i think a good exhibition that's been received really well but a difficult thing to publish so i'm now seeking out um, a publisher to uh, publish a, 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 an abridged version of it. And there's a, a French translation, and this winter I'll be completing an audiobook version of it with Nick Kipfer, who is a Montreal-based musician and sound artist. Uh, and that concludes my presentation. Uh, and let's see if I can get back to Zoom here. Okay. All right, Maya, are you there? I am here. Uh, you should have a, oops, you should have a um, stop sharing button, probably. Uh, stop sharing. Thank there you. you go. That's yeah. the one. Thank you, Jim. Okay. Uh, how's that? <laughs> no, I'm done. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> oh, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for uh, having me, uh, g giving me this chance to, to, to present my book. Yeah, and I understand now you're going to speak a little bit about your um, trekking and art making experiences. Uh, for those uh, who are interested, Maya and, I, Maya and I became friends originally when we realized that we both had this interest in long distance walking and book arts and connecting the two. Uh, I thought that I was hardcore for doing these long treks and then realized that Maya sometimes hikes across small countries and, <laughs> and uh, will be out there for many weeks on end, um, walking either alone or with different companions. Yeah, um, so we figured it would be a good chance to combine the two into one, sort of relate like these super niche <laughs> affinities for walking and drawing and making books out of the experiences of walking um so yeah we figured it would be like a good way to to share these two different practices that are similar in some ways and then it will be like fodder for a question period or comments or yeah and then just launch us on um on the 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 tail end of the of the talk. Um, I haven't tested the uh, share screening, just a portion. And then I wonder, let me see, advance a portion of the screen, which can I choose beforehand? Uh, there you go, portion just to here. Mm -hmm. Something of the sort. Does that work? Wonderful. Um, this is just an example of an artist book that I came across in the uh, Tokyo Art Book Fair that I was at last July. Um, and I just thought it was a really lovely example of using um, uh, things from nature in the making of a book. This one much more literal than drawing or taking photos or writing while on hikes, um, but I really loved it. Um, yeah, so for me, the different experiences that I have in landscapes and environments through walking informs a lot of my work, I believe. Um, I think that it holds a really significant place in who I've become personally and artistically, I'd say. Um, it's a form I really love and return to often. And one of the reasons for that, as um, the Amaranth Borsic said the other day in her talk, which uh, I thought was really well, um, is because of their really capacious definition. Like they can hold so many different things. Um, and to me, they hold a really special place in the fact that they're at the junction of all of these different ways of making art, like for documenting and archiving, making completely new work and even literature. Um, so there's that, and also the fact that they range from either a really precious, unique object, as your Book of 19 Nocturnes currently is, um, or something that you can disseminate massively um, for really cheap. And in the end, they can, they have the potential to both be a really an educational tool, if that's a way to, that you like to make books, or a really um, 
effective art object. Um, yeah, so I figured I would follow the same uh, um, structure of a talk as you did by uh, starting with different important types that has, that have shaped. Oh, how do I go to the next one in this view? Whoop. Okay. Voila. <laughs> Um, some of my first long hikes, uh, long-ish hikes, um, were in Iceland that happened from a failed trip that I was supposed to go with friends that fell through, but then that was my opportunity to travel as I wanted to travel, which was trying to hike for really long times. So the first one I did was uh, this one on the left. Um, the red section here is like a very, very popular um, trail in Iceland, but then I decided to combine it with this um, orange section. Then I took a break because that was already a week long and I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> I thought I was going to be really hardcore and not um, bring a source of fire to cook anything. So I missed that instantly. It was a terrible idea. I'm not that hardcore, bought something in town and then went back out to do this other section <laughs> to the right. Um, Iceland looks wonderful. Like This is um, some photos that I took along the way. Um, one of the things I do always carry, apart from notebooks, um, to journal in the evening, uh, write observations, um, is a super heavy camera setup. Um, for long hikes, you of course bring as little things as possible, but then my concession to that is a sketchbook and pencils and also uh, this really heavy analog camera that weighs as much as like my sleeping bag, my sleeping mat maybe even my tent combined. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's where the photos are from. Um, my second experience hiking was in Newfoundland uh, along the East Coast Trail, which if you take this section here near to St. John, um, there's uh, much of the coast on the side, um, after which we uh, hitchhike across the island. And on the Western coast here is uh, Gross Morn Park, um, which is this view here. Um, and looks amazing. It's a beautiful place and we don't have many fjords in Canada, but that's one of them. Um, the year after that was the Great Divide Trail, which I didn't complete. Um, it was the plan for this summer, but then you know what happened. And um, <laughs> then when my partner and I first um, went out west to do it, we didn't have time to do the whole thing, but we started about here-ish, I believe, near to Banff, between Banff and Golden, um, and went up until Mount Robson. Um, and I, yeah, if anyone loves first Canada in the Rockies and second to hiking, the Great Divide Trail, it's called, is phenomenal and a patchwork of these very new lovely trails and old trails that need a lot of help. Um, but it's a really, like, probably one of my favorite trails, if not the favorite, even though that's hard to say. Um, and it looks a little bit like that, either super lovely with the flowering, because the wildflowers up there are incredible, or super barren, like the one on the left, which is just south of Jasper. Um, after that, <laughs> the year after that, um, we hiked all across Switzerland. Um, and then even continued a little bit further into Chamonix here, um, just because we had time and wanted to. And well, Switzerland is postcard pretty. <laughs> There's no other way to say it. Um, and uh, yeah, then that brings us to basically, the, these are yeah the biggest hikes that I've done and what yeah inspires a lot of making books and drawing. Um, my sketchbooks are yay big, <laughs> smaller than, than yours, and I haven't been going as long, so my pile of them isn't as impressive. Um, but I definitely mostly draw from observation also, um, but also write quite a bit during hiking, either yeah, observations or moods and feelings, and those wind up making their way into either specifically and like concretely into the book works or um, or noting down ideas for them or observations that then inform moods and ideas. Um, so there are a lot of drawings of mountains <laughs> in the sketchbooks. Um, some of them have also been done uh, throughout the last year um, 
my partner and I went and lived in Golden, BC last winter. So there was um, a lot of mountain drawing to be done at that time also. Um, these are from, uh, well, yeah, the last book fair I was at in, in Japan. Uh, there's a shrine here and this really scraggly tree that was along um, the river in town. Um, some of them are also from memory, like these ones. Um, and yeah, I dabble a little bit in ink, but I'd say I'm much more comfortable on graphite. And there's also a little bit of trial and error with um, soft pastels going on there. <laughs> um, I'm really interested in the history of the book, different formats of books. They're really wide definition from yeah clay to to wax to the codex that we all know to scrolls and the history of that oh there's a book repeated there oh well <laughs> and the history of that I found to be really interested in especially in the past year um, and these are some of the books that yeah have uh, shaped my understanding of it and the artist book and then this is just a little uh, selection of books on walking that have become important throughout, um, which, yeah, the Rebecca Solnit is, of course, one of them. Um, and uh, there's this one book in particular on the left completely called The Art of Walking that documents um, specific artwork that use walking in as like an integral part of the artwork. So that's a really good one. Um, and the second one that I would recommend also for, for the specifics of this talk is um, this book by Anne Magdalene de la Croix. It was called Un Vulo Ergosum which is just the, uh, a play on um, the think, therefore I am, this the walk, therefore I am, um, and documents a few different artist books in particular that deal with walking. It's the most specific one I found yet. <laughs> um, so the way that I like to make books, um, well, first off, I really enjoy the format of the book. So I always want them to be a really pleasant material to hold or a material that will definitely direct um, the attention towards the physicality of the book, which I think is like a, an essential um, definition of artist books is the physicality of them. Um, and to pay attention yeah, to both the message and the, or the sum of the material and the formal elements in the message. Um, so, I brought a few to show physically. This one I have in person too. Um, is the, it comes in a uh, folder. And one of the ways that I found that making um, materials that are really evocative to me is being able to make them myself. So one of them is paper. And so this was one of my very first paper projects. Um, at Concordia, there's a paper making class, which is really lovely. Um, and yeah, so these papers are either recycled paper or um, cotton. And I waxed all of them to make them translucent, which it's one of the, the methods I use a lot to make, um, to make paper translucent. And here I've transferred an image, an inkjet image onto the wax. Um, and I can't see my video, so I'm not sure if it's a, a good, um, there you go. If it's a good view, but, uh, um, you can transfer images in the same way uh, that you do it, you know, when you're a kid and you put glue on an image and then rub the paper off and the ink only stays in the glue in that same way, but with um, wax, it also works. So that's how that's made. Um, but they're images that I took hiking and then transferred onto this uh, waxy handmade paper. And there's a collection of them. Um, after that, I took out an accordion book just for, just for, um, <laughs> for your accordion nocturnes. Um, and it doesn't really have to do with hiking in particular, but um, I took it out just for the format. <laughs> and there are these um, uh, woodcuts that I printed the handmade way with the back of a spoon <laughs> until there wasn't any ink on it anymore. Um, and they live in this little accordion. Um, yeah, I don't have a photo of that one, which is why I'm showing you in person. Um, one down. I've got this book made of glass which was 
a stubborn challenge <laughs> of mine, um, but is uh, another material that I want to continue working with just because I haven't like 100% figured out how to do a clean, great binding with it um, in the works. But it's mostly a book of, uh, of photographs, or specifically of Iceland. Um, and the photo in the slide now is um, when it was exhibited during an Art Matters exhibit a couple of years ago. Um, and then another way that walking manifests in stuff that I do is definitely in observations of, of landscape, of little details in the landscape. Um, these are just little intaglios that were part of a different book project. Um, and yes, the another final way that I wanted to show is in definitely I want to get better at writing. It's not something that I'm super comfortable with yet. Um, but here I collaborated with my great friend Juliette Perry Denis, and we put together a little um, book of short stories on our um, on our experiences walking specifically uh, as women. And so it ranges definitely, there's a lot of hiking in the wild, but also some on walking in cities at night and walking in cities as younger women. Um, and so we came up with this little thing that we put together a few years ago. And um, yeah, I'm really proud of it. I like it. And of course, well, since I work as a book binder, then it had to have something fun in the binding. So it's um, signature bound, but then the inside cover is this fold out image. <laughs> and then it folds back into itself as a book. Um, yeah. Uh, here's a really a well known um, diagram of Clive Philippos trying to describe what space the artist book takes as a definition um, and it's just to show that it is really porous and still contentious as a definition but I think that they're because of that they sit at a really interesting junction and is why I really like them. I end with book bless you from cow books in Tokyo. <laughs> voilà. That's fantastic Maya. Thank you for that. <clears throat> <laughs> wow. Um, the, yeah. the craftsmanship and the tactile qualities is wonderful in your work. You. Yeah, uh, even making your own paper. And um, it was very interesting to look at these translucent um, waxed pages and also these glass covers. Yeah, uh, I clearly have something for, yeah, transparency and yeah. And paper, making paper is a really cool way of really um, deciding what kind of materiality you want books to have. And mm -hmm. it's something that I had, yeah, first um, got to discover at Concordia in um, Ashley Miller's uh, paper making class, but that I've since had the pleasure to do an artist residency and then start working in a paper making studio uh, here in town called Atelier Etai. And yeah, the work that she makes there, so she is incredible and I admire her and is super experimental in what you can do with paper, wild. Yeah, no, but thanks for that. I've got questions already for us. Yeah, we have about six minutes. Uh, <laughs> we uh, <clears throat> see what people have to ask. For sure. I mean, I don't mind um, going slightly over if people are, aren't impatient. Um, to go through the questions that we do have. But yeah, if we can aim for about an hour for people's evenings, then we're, we're good to go. I've got one here saying, thanks for the beautiful and fascinating talk. A question, Jim, you mentioned a childhood interest in imaginary creatures and an idea of transformation becoming something other than what you were or are. I was wondering if you could offer some insight as to why you had an openness to uh, an openness to and an interest in all types of beings and creatures and transformation? Um, you know, I, I don't quite know why, um, as a child, anybody gets completely fixated on one thing or another. I had a dinosaur fascination that was really deep, like a lot of little kids, especially little boys, and I just didn't outgrow mine. Um, but that my interest in, an, in animals, like, 
I don't know. It could be partly my 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 family. We're always quite interested in animals. Like my my stepdad Bruce will always you know bring me a toad he finds, or you know he knows the names of the birds that are at the bird feeders. Um, and you know I had cats, and I spent a lot. They were my my best friend was a cat when I was a kid. Um, <clears throat> but I think that maybe just taking the time. I still you know if you. You can, it's really easy to walk by some like weird bug, but if you stop for a second and look at it, I still get completely uh, fascinated by, and I, I am continually finding animals I've never seen before. Just a couple of days ago, I found this long spider on a reed in a marsh that looked like a piece of, um, of, of like a grass seed. It was completely camouflaged in that area. And when you watch them, you can see all these, you know, you notice when the creature is scared or if, Maybe the creature is confused. Spiders will sometimes run toward you because they're trying to get into your, your shadow. Um, I, my little sister really hated spiders and things, so I'd always be rescuing um, crane flies and spiders out of the shower so that she could uh, use the bathroom in peace. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know, I hung out with people that weren't afraid to pick up snakes and other creatures. And I, I guess I, I grew up thinking that, um, yeah, they weren't. Necessarily, they're probably not dangerous. <laughs> they're probably cohabitants with me in the house, and they, they probably mean no harm most of the time. And I, I guess I think that uh, animals are important too. Like after all, human beings are animals, and I don't think we really have more right to exist on this planet than other kinds of beings. Um, and some creatures really know things we don't. Like we have no idea what sonar is. Um, we can't see in the dark. Um, we can't taste a temperature in the air like a snake could. And trying to imagine perceptions I don't have, I think it touches my uh, sense of agnosticism almost, of this feeling of reassuring doubt that I don't know everything and can't. But that challenge of trying to imagine what it's like is uh, valuable, even if I'll never get to the bottom of it. Yeah. <clears throat> How's that? <laughs> And I'll mark this as done. Um, I've got some thank yous and incredible drawings and paintings and books, Jim. Thanks. Um, thank you for the inspiring talk. For Maya, do you make the paper depending on the project you're aiming to, like connections between the content and the material of the paper? Or are they mostly created first and assemble them together afterwards? Um, I think when I first began and didn't have all the knowledge necessary to really craft the paper specifically for what I wanted to do with it, um, it was more in the first instance of even just like successfully making paper and then using it um, either to wax it or to use also, um, I did uh, use quite a bit of it in printmaking also. Um, but since having more experience with paper, then I can definitely craft the specific paper for what I'm intending to do with it. Um, and for an example, one of those instances is I have this long haul project that I'm dreaming of doing where I'd like to recreate or make an, uh, to recreate a series of different bindings and make a timeline out of them. So for example, I'd like to make a, a scroll format book um, out of Japanese kozo paper and then I'd like to make a medieval book out of rag, rag paper and so with that project I'm aiming to yeah make a physical timeline of important um, developments in bookbinding and in paper making um, which requires specific papers uh, for it to make any sense at all so a bit of both, but now that I can, I think it's uh, it's great to make papers specifically for for projects. Yeah. Let's see. How has the pandemic affected your love of walking and travel? Has it been difficult, or have you found ways to satisfy those desires locally or at home? Do you want to start? Well. <laughs> Yeah, I was on a 27 day trek to an artist residency in Nepal and at really high altitude I crossed over 5,000 meter, uh, 5,000 meter, 5,400 meter pass where there had been an internet and cell phone blackout 
And uh, Nepal was really late to be affected by the pandemic. I had no idea what was going on until I came down to the first village with road access and everything was very weird. And this uh, country had gone into lockdown the day before. And so uh, my girlfriend and I were evacuated and uh, stuck in a hotel for a while and able to go outside except for a couple hours a day when it was permitted to look for food or medicine. And then we're repatriated the long way around the planet, over 50 hours through airports, had to quarantine at my mom's house in BC. And then, yeah, we had a lot, everything, like most artists, we had the rug pulled out from under us. All our plans were changed. Um, I landed pretty uh, well as far as things go. I've been at my dad's house on Salt Spring Island, which is, um, uh, has had very few uh, cases of COVID and also it's easy to, to isolate from people. And I have a little room where I can, uh, uh, I have, I've got room to draw, I have a studio there. Um, like a lot of people, I've gotten really into gardening and just being outside and, and making that more of a creative activity than it ever has for me before. Partly is I haven't been able to travel, so I have to stay put and um, it's much more satisfying to be able to eat some of the things you grow in a garden. Um, I've also gotten more into kayaking because I don't bump into anybody except seals out there. Um, so I'm really lucky to be in a place where I can do that. Um, all, most of my community and friends back in Montreal have had a really different experience. It really sounds a lot harder, I have to say. Yeah. Yeah. How about you, Maya? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, for sure, dif different hiking plans have been thrown out the window, um, which, yeah, is unfortunate, but um, I feel like even locally, there's so much to see, and it's one of the reasons why I think um, I made a point to continue walking more within Canada, just because we do have a like incredible variety of of landscapes here um at the same time i feel like drawing can be done in a lot of places and for me drawing is a, a really great um exercise in observing details that you wouldn't notice otherwise and so that can be done anywhere even though it isn't in a grandiose landscape um, those kinds of details and observation can be done anywhere so i think that's yeah the a way to satisfy those kinds of desires at home. Um, yeah, I've got a bunch more, Dim. <laughs> I'll, I'll, um, uh, I'll be here as long as you're uh, <laughs> uh, comfortable hanging out, Maya. I've got no deadline. Last one. We may end in grand. <laughs> I've got one in French here that I can translate, mais pour la lire en français, um, qu'est-ce qui pour vous lit l'amour du livre d'artiste et la randonnée? Um, which can be translated as what would be, what would link both um, artist books and hiking? What would be the, the link that would um, connect those two different? Um, well, in some ways, I think there's, again, the t tactile thing where um, one's feet and hands must travel. Um, also, our eyes travel. Um, both by looking at a land landscape um, and especially if you're drawing it and by reading. So sometimes I actually feel that I'm reading a mountain uh, differently than just kacha walk on. You don't have to look back. Uh, if you're drawing something or if you're, you know, it could be a person or a mountain, you really have to look at the details. And I, I find myself walking through the um, contours of a mountain with my eyes. It takes a lot longer time. And I end up noticing details that I just wouldn't if I didn't stop to do so. Um, and I think that, again, there's this immersive thing that happens in both senses. When you're reading a story or maybe even watching a movie that telling, telling a story, you can become transported by a sense of suspended disbelief. You forget that you're in a movie theater or that you're sitting in a chair reading a book and you're carried away by whatever Tolstoy is saying to you or whoever you're reading. Um, that's a psychological immersion. Uh, that happens as a physical sense of immersion while I'm walking. Um, Maya and I, and I are both fans of Rebecca Solnit and we're speaking a little earlier about her thought of the mind at three miles an hour, how we think differently while walking than sitting. Um, 
And I find this happens all the time, even though I can believe that right now the Himalayas are out there. Uh, it seems hypothetical. It seems like, like, a, a, like some kind of myth that I read about, not something that I actually have been to or that, you know, where people are living and right now. And um, that, there's this strange thing that happens after walking for a few days uh, where this kind of experience, looking into your computer screen, this becomes the hypothetical. Remember when we used to talk on Zoom? Uh, all of that world is gone. And I, I think that that, again, is a sense of transformation. Rather than changing into a different animal, um, I, in a way, I, I change into a different kind of being from being in a different kind of place. And going from inside to outside into a wilderness or an urban setting it gives me perspectives on the other points of view. Um, and uh, yeah, I think traveling in general does that. It's constantly refreshing the way that we perceive. I've got a comment from Noah saying, for Jim, I think I have an obsession towards monsters too, especially dragons for some reason. I also learned Chinese ink painting when I was a kid. It's really encouraging to see an almost cross-cultural approach to deliver this monster story. I want to thank you for the awesome talk and work sharing. My pleasure, thanks for that <laughs> comment. Yeah. yeah, I think dragons connect through dinosaurs, probably across cultures, um, because so many places in the world dig up these incredible bones and we have to make sense out of that somehow. They basically, whether or not there's dinosaurs, there's dragons now, they're kind of used to be. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> um, I've got, uh, have you thought about translating the nocturnes into a VR experience? Ooh. Well, so far I'm still trying to translate it into a published experience. Um, I have thought that it could make a wonderful animation if I had a team of animators to work on that with me. Um, and I have even thought that, yeah, like a, kind of a video game experience, it could be really amazing, but it's not my area of expertise. Um, my drawing uh, is almost always completely manual. Um, I, don't, I just don't know how to do that. So I've, I've been keeping it with, in a way, I want to get better at writing. I, 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 now I would like to write new stories and collections of smaller stories. Um, but if I was to encounter um, artists who are up for collaborating in a VR project, I'd be interested in that. In a way, the audiobook will be kind of like that. I listen to a lot of audiobooks while I'm drawing. Uh, so you could potentially look at the book either digitally or physically while listening to it as well. Mm -hmm. It's not quite VR, but it's leaning that way a bit. I've got one from Robert asking, Jim, are the people in the mountains monsters? Well, <clears throat> the monsters are in the eye of the beholder a lot of the time. <laughs> um, whether uh, being, uh, be it an animal or another person, is uh, threatening or protective, uh, troubling or reassuring, kind of depends on you. <laughs> Um, we make people and places and creatures monstrous. They, I don't believe, are often monstrous in and of themselves. Um, a lot of things that we think of as monstrous, it, it really depends on your perspective. I don't think of, monster, of people as monstrous, but I do, uh, when I think about it, I, I think that humans are probably more dangerous than any of the other creatures out there. Um, so uh, I think uh, human activity collectively is often monstrous in a really frightening way, but also human collectivity is sometimes really amazing. Like even the fact that we're able to have this Zoom conversation from opposite sides of the continent and maybe even other continents watching, um, that's amazing. Um, it's very complex. Some people I do find monstrous, but I don't know if you'll find the same ones to be monstrous. Yeah. Got another, for both Maya and Jim, is there a life bucket list item you're willing to share with us? You want to go first or me, Maya? <laughs> um, I feel like my hiking bucket list is never ending. That's yeah. for sure. Mm. So yeah, the one I was supposed to do um, this summer of um, the Great Divide Trail, of going back to it and doing the whole thing once over, well, instead of 
completing the parts that we missed. Uh, the plan was to go over the whole thing. Since I've never also um, actually done the same hike twice, which is something I'm really curious in doing because you yeah, come across, even you go to different places as a different person, so they're different every time. Um, so that one is is on the to do whenever I can bucket list. Um, yeah, and then completing that um, long haul uh, historical bookbinding project is a related but um, other life bucket list item. <laughs> How about you? Well, uh, as for uh, traveling to draw, um, I would really, really love to go to Haida Gwaii. That's for sure the top of my list of places that I've never been that I would love to go. Um, in Haida Gwaii, I think I would also like to travel a bit by kayak and draw from the water following coastline. That's the top of my bucket list. Um, for art, um, you know, if I could go back in time, I might not have decided to make a 500 page book over 17 years that is so large it's difficult to publish. I might have been wiser to make uh, 10 books, each 50 pages long, and work at it piece by piece in that way. Uh, anyhow, I would like to do that now, and I would like to get better at finding ways to integrate text and drawing. Uh, that is almost for sure leaning in a comic book direction to make works that are more graphic novel in character. And um, also in my process to be, rather than doing a bunch of writing and a bunch of drawing and then colliding them together, to be working on them more simultaneously, back and forth. They are really different ways of thinking uh, verbally or, or visually, but I would like to find a way to uh, be, uh, have a, find a process that's more stream of consciousness, interweaving of those things as they grow. Uh, short stories, prose poems, collections of things, smaller stuff, yeah. That goes through the questions that we do have, that we that have had. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you so much for your time throughout this traveling I know you've been doing. Um, I've got another one. <laughs> We're not done. Um, from Gina Maya, thank you for sharing your beautiful work. I was wondering, what is it about glass that you find most promising or appealing as a book medium? Aha. Um, yeah, I guess as it's been a little bit obvious I've got something for transparency and the um, different affordances in, it has in seeing um, many things at once or in the case of glass reflecting something at you um, but I always tend to make things that um, look or feel a little bit delicate also um, so I think the the surprise of glass as a, a book medium is interesting in and of itself um, but then for also the, the same reasons of transparency and um, fragile aspects of it. Um, and then there's, there's just the challenge of it also, I find pretty fun. Um, and I keep having ideas for it that I'll have to try out and see what kind of binding works best for. Um, and finding the different material that you need in order to make the book out of glass too has been a little bit wild. Um, for example, um, the what's acting as a book cloth on this so rather than having like a, a woven cloth like this one that is usually backed with paper just so the glue doesn't seep through when you're gluing it in place um, a cloth clearly I haven't heard of a transparent book cloth yet so what it is in fact and then what you see at the spine that is the malleable part here. Um, it's actually the material that they put on window panes for businesses so that when like the glass breaks it doesn't shatter everywhere and it stays in one piece. Um, so that's what I found as a, a workaround. So the material challenge is pretty fun too. Um, yeah and then it can I guess if we, we want to stretch it a little bit more then relate to contents in the in the idea especially for um, images of Iceland where um, things are constantly moving in the fact that it's melting um, it's cold <laughs> and there's a lot of reflection happening in that place because of the sun and the water and uh, the snow yeah 
<laughs> I think it brings a kind of uh, danger to the reading process <laughs> where there's something that, you know, you can be, uh, that would be quite the paper cut if your glass uh, <laughs> broke. I did sand the edges, but then if it broke, yeah. <laughs> right. And it takes reading from this casual thing to a slightly risky uh, activity. <laughs> Um, if anyone has extra questions, if not, we can say goodbyes. Um, thanks for the participants throughout all of the weekend and all of these four days. I want to thank you guys for tuning into all of these things remotely, even though it's been a weird, a weird way to engage in a book fair. So thanks for that. And thank you, Jim, for the time today and willingness to share. My pleasure, Maya. Thank you so much for including me. Yeah, this has been really fun. This was a good closing event. Very happy. <laughs> All right, then. I'll talk to you soon, Jin. Okay, and Maya. to everyone else, au revoir. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everybody. All the best out there.